Hello, good afternoon. My name is Marcelo Amato, and we are going to talk about new developments on electrical impedance tomography. I have a slight conflict of interest because I participate in the research of some um, electrical impedance tomography machines. A few years ago, uh, there was this very important publication by Costa and collaborators, and they showed that it was possible to estimate the amount of collapse and hyperdistension in electrical impedance tomography with a very good precision. In this preliminary paper, the concept was launched and they had some preliminary validation with CT. What they were showing is that, for instance, uh, when you do a decremental PIP trial, you start with a high PIP level of 25 and you see some hyperdistension in the CT. And then uh, you decrease the PIP level to seven, for instance, and you start to see some collapse in the dependent lung zones. And then you can use an algorithm in the EIT device to capture pixels in which the regional compliance is very low because of hyperdistension and they are represented in white. And you can also detect pixels in which compliance is low, but now because you have alveolar collapse and, and the units were not working any longer. And there were some advantages with this procedure because then we get rid of some problems with the Hounsfield units in CT. And uh, sometimes also uh, CT can be affected by the baseline disease affecting densities and this is not the case for EIT. Later on, we did some comparison of uh, collapse uh, estimates by CT and by EIT in some experiment, experiments in pigs and we have shown a very nice correlation between CT estimates and EIT. And uh, nowadays some devices they can provide you with uh, some automatic PIP titration. You can have some dis online display where you see lung collapse, for instance in red, hyperdistension in blue, compliance uh, of the respiratory system or of the slice represented by EIT in green. And then you can pick up a certain PIP level, for instance, that uh, you have the best compromise between collapse and hyperdistension. Um, later on, we had uh, some other validation studies comparing CT and EIT and all of them, they showed a very nice agreement in terms of compliance, uh, in terms of collapse estimation. Another study and some Lundy Altman plots, all of them showing a very good agreement between CT and EIT. So, which means that you can rely very much in these measurements at the bedside. So multiple studies, some of them published, some of them in press, they are going, uh, all of them, they are very consistent and this correlation is very nice. You can also play a little bit with CT, um, doing a kind of functional analysis with CT to have exactly the same results as you have with EIT. For instance, this is the conventional on the left, conventional CT images during a decremental PIP trial then you can make a functional analysis on CT, comparing this slice with this slice and so forth, like we do with e EIT, and you can see exactly the same results, except that EIT is showing hyperdistension in white, and here we are showing red. So you see hyperdistension decreases also in the CT, and then we started to see some collapsed lung zones in blue, in CT and EIT, and a lot of collapse in both. So no doubt that we are capturing the same phenomenon in both technologies. 
This is an experiment that we perform in our lab. This is an isolated lung preparation, and we are ventilating this lung with pressure control ventilation. And uh, this is a very nice setup because the PEEP level I'm applying in this isolated preparation is exactly transpulmonary and expiratory pressure. Okay, look what happened with lung compliance, isolated lung preparation versus PEEP during this decremental PEEP trial. As you can see, compliance goes up because you are relieving over distension and then you have a peak of compliance and then compliance deteriorates. And we have very good evidence that this is caused by airway or alveolar collapse. I'm going to show you. And then this peak is always happening at a transpulmonary pressure of two or three. And this is a very constant value for mammals all over across this species. So every mammal has an ideal compliance when transpulmonary pressures at end expirations are around three, two to three centimeters of water. Uh, we have done multiple uh, isolated lung preparation tests uh, using CT, also to detect lung collapse. And we can always uh, demonstrate that you don't have any collapse when your transpulmonary pressures are above five. And then they started to increase exponentially when they reach two or three centimeters of water. So this is an example of uh, different animals, all of them presenting a deterioration of compliance when transpulmonary pressures were below three centimeters of water. So we can use the same rationale to understand uh, for each pixel, when this pixel is reaching a transpulmonary pressure around three centimeters of water. So very likely, if you can detect this pixel behavior across an EIT slice, and when you see that this pixel is presenting this peaking compliance, and then if you decrease further your PEEP level, your compliance of the pixel deteriorates, this, uh, uh, the meaning of this is that the regional transpulmonary pressure is about two or three centimeters of water. So, then we use this principle to have some animals and patients in which we had an esophageal balloon at the same time that we had EIT. And the esophageal balloon is in this position. And uh, our hypothesis is that whenever the EIT was detecting uh, this behavior of the pixel at this level of the lung, we should measure at the same time a transpulmonary pressure of plus two, either using an esophageal balloon or a pleural pressure sensor. And uh, then you can also imagine that pixels above this level, they are going to be in this part of the curve, and then they are going to present some decreased compliance because of overdistension. And pixels below this level, they are going to have decreased compliance because of collapse. And so now we have applied these, uh, we have expanded this concept to patients and animals, and we have consistently demonstrated that whenever you see this crossing point between collapse and hyperdistension, you know that for this particular patient, the average transpulmonary pressure at the mid part of the lung must be slightly positive around two or three centimeters of water. And then below this level, uh, transpulmonary pressures started to be negative as proven in this study. And above this level, transpulmonary pressures are, uh, they, they should be a little bit positive. And then this 
patient should present some hyperdistension here presented in blue. We have demonstrated this also in CT. Uh, and then whenever our transpulmonary pressures are above two centimeters of water, there is no tidal recruitment, no collapse. And they are below two or three centimeters of water of end expiratory transpulmonary pressures, you start to see hyperdistension. So we have used this principle for PIP titration, and whenever we see the crossing point, we know that for our EIT, this is the ideal PIP, but also for esophageal pressure measurements, if you have a well-calibrated esophageal balloon. This was a very important insight. So it's, and it's a convergency of technologies. So if you are titrating PIP using EIT, you have approximately the same results as if you are using a well-calibrated esophageal balloon. And uh, we have used this principle in many publications, and we have shown a very consistent relationship between the optimum PIP level and body mass index. And interesting enough, this uh, regression equation is representing the behavior of many patients, and this regression equation is exactly the same if I constructed this curve with EIT or with an esophageal balloon, like these uh, investigators and like these other investigators. So there is a consistent relationship between body mass index and transpulmonary and expiratory pressures um, or, or pleural pressure, which means that the the more obese is the patient, the higher the PIP level he needs. Okay, now changing slightly the subject. Another important development in EIT is the analysis of perfusion when you inject a bolus of saline solution. In fact, it's a hypertonic saline solution. We have uh, this important publication doing a validation of this method, showing that we can estimate with very good precision the perfusion of animals. And now we are applying this principle to patients, and I'm going to share with you uh, some few interesting results. This is the ventilation map produced by EIT in a patient in which we were increasing PIP levels from 6, 12, and 18 centimeters of water. Finally, this patient was turned prone, applying at the average PIP of 12. So these patients, they had COVID-19 disease. We did at the same time a perfusion analysis with EIT, and now we have developed a software to do the VQ ratio of these two, uh, these two analysis. Uh, to calibrate the perfusion part, you need the cardiac output. And this is very easy with, uh, if you have thermal dilution, but you can use also the uh, saline bolus to calculate the cardiac output. And then you can construct this kind of map. This is a VQ map of this patient at this PIP level. In red, shunting areas. In green, normal VQ, ideal perfusion to ventilation map. And in blue, dead space areas. And then it's interesting to observe that when we, we increase PIP from 6 to 18, we decrease shunt areas and we increase the good match in this patient and this was associated with an increase in PO2. More interesting though, is that when we turn the patient to prone positioning, we see some better matching of ventilation and perfusion. Let's see in details. This is the evolution. So shunting areas decreasing when we increase PIP, but when we turn the patient prone, we got the best benefit with uh, almost no shunt except for the ventral areas, because this map should be showed in this position. So we still have a little bit of shunt in gravity-oriented zones, 
but we have a much better VQ map with more green areas with good ratio between ventilation and perfusion. It's still a little bit of dead space, but not much, much better than in Supai. Some other examples, in this, also in this particular patient, there was lots of shunt at the low PEEP levels, which improved a lot with a resulting much better oxygenation when we increase PEEP. And interesting enough, that space did not increase much from this level to this level. So for, particularly for this patient, high PEEP was beneficial. But not always this is the case. And finally, our last slide is a patient with COVID-19 and presenting a pulmonary emboli. As you can see, there was a large thrombi in pulmonary artery vessels. There was also some thrombi in this vessel, but you still can see some contrast here, meaning that the perfusion was maintained in this region. So it was kept almost constant. But this region had a very impaired perfusion. As a result, when we did the EIT analysis, we didn't see much perfusion in this zone. And we did, when we performed the VQ map, we could see lots of dead space in this zone. And interesting enough, we could see lots of shunt in this area. And this was not initially expected, except that this patient had severe hypoxemia. But what is happening here is that because of these emboli, perfusion had to suffer some diversion to the right lung. And then the hyperflow here is causing a lot of shunt. And this is causing the hypoxemia in this patient with some shunt in those atelectatic areas. So these maps, they have helped us a lot to understand the pathophysiology of these patients and also to detect some imminent problems at the bedside. Thank you.